Act 17. This is April 2nd, 2014. Use MTB 110 Section 1, Campus 1. Today is day number 23 in the week number 11. So let us get started. Well, welcome back. This is the last day before the Easter holiday. So we expect that our many students will come back. Well, but anyway, this is day number 22 into the semester. And here is week number 11. If you remember correctly, we finished the basics on chapter 4. Okay, and we are selling in chapter 5, which is integrations. And on Monday, we have to understand the context of anti-derivatives. And I hope that you me. have done some good work there and got some good grade on the quiz yesterday. Today, we are getting into the definite integrals and also connecting the questions of what is meant by integrations with the ideas of the areas, calculations, particularly using rectangles. So, we're going to spend about 15 minutes' time getting used to the ideas of definite integrals, and then we'll get back to some of the basics, uh, which hopefully could help you understand much better the remaining chapter 5, and also getting started with the integrations applications. So today it's day number 22, and uh, this is a slight mistake here, it's going to be April the 2nd, not April the 4th, okay? So let's get started with the definite integrals. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit. Welcome back. We we'll take attendance towards the end of this session. So we're going on to the third unit here. So we're getting started with unit three. And uh, this is our intro to uh, integration. Basically, the second half of the calculus after differentiation. Today, what I'll talk about is what are known as definite integrals. And 
We have a notation for this, which is uh, the, the notation used in calculus for this as opposed to some geometric notation. And that's uh, the following expression. It's called an integral, but now it's going to have what are known as limits on it. It'll start at A and end at B. And we write in the function, f of x dx. So this is what's known as a definite integral. And it's interpreted geometrically as the area of the curve. The only difference between this collection of symbols and what we had before with indefinite integrals is that before we didn't specify where it started and where it ended. Now, in order to understand what to do with this guy, uh, I'm going to just describe very, very abstractly what we do and then carry out uh, one example uh, in, in detail. So, to compute this area, we're going to follow uh, initially three steps. First of all, we're going to divide into rectangles. And unfortunately, because it's impossible to divide a curvy region into rectangles, we're going to cheat. So they're only quote unquote rectangles. They're almost rectangles. And the second thing we're going to do is to add up the areas. And the third thing we're going to do is to uh, rectify this problem that we didn't actually hit the answer on the nose. So we were missing some pieces or, or choosing some extra bits. And the way we'll rectify that is by taking the limit <coughs> as the rectangles get fit. Infinitesimal theory. Pictorially, again, that looks like this. We have A and our P, and we have our guy here, curve. And I'm going to chop it up. First, I'm going to chop up the uh, x axis into uh, little increments. And then I'm going to chop things up here, and I'll decide on some rectangle in some sphere based pattern. Here so much. Uh, in some cases, the rectangles overshoot. In some cases, they're underneath. So the new area that I'm adding up is, is off. It's not quite the same as the area on the curve. It's it's got it's this region here. It includes these extra bits here, and then it's missing this this little guy here. It's there. It's missing. And as I say, these little pieces up here, this little bit up here is extra. Alright, so that's why they're here. We're not really dividing up the region into rectangles, we're just taking rectangles. And then the, the idea is that as these get thinner and thinner, the little itty bitty amounts that we missed by are going to zero. Already you can see it's kind of thin. So we're not missing by much. As, as these get thinner and thinner, the problem goes away and we get the uh, answer on the nodes. Alright, so here's our first example. I'll take the first interesting curve, which is uh, f of x is equal to x squared. I don't want to uh, do anything more complicated than one example because this is a, a, a real labor here that we're going to go through. And to make things easy for myself, I'm going to start at A equals zero, but in order to see what the pattern is, I'm going to allow B to be arbitrary. Let's uh, draw a graph and start 
bringing things up. So here's the parabola, and there's this piece that we want, which is going to stop at this place B here. And the first step is to divide into uh, n pieces. That means, well, graphically, I'll just mark the first three. Maybe there are going to be many of them. And then I'll draw some rectangles here. And I'm going to choose to make the rectangles all the way from the right. And I'll make this staircase pattern like this. That's my choice. I get to choose whatever level I want, and I'm going to choose the right ends as the uh, as the shape of the staircase. So I'm overshooting with each right. And now I have to write down formulas for what these areas are. Now the, there's one big advantage that rectangles have, and this is the starting place, which is the air. It's easy to find your areas. All you need to know is the base and the height, and you multiply and get the area. That's the reason why we can get started with rectangles. And in this case, these distances, I'm assuming that they're all equal, equally spaced intervals, and I'll always be doing that. And so the spacing, the bases, base length, is always b divided by n.
So what we're heading for is the simple formula as opposed to the complicated one. All right, so the, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is factor out all of these b over n factors. There's a b over n here, and there's a b over n squared. So all told, we have a b over n quantity cubed as a common factor. And then the first term is 1, and the second term what's left over is 2 squared, 2 squared. And then the third term would be 3 squared, although I haven't written it. And the last term, there's an extra factor of n squared. is to eventually take the limit as n goes to infinity here. And the quantity that's hard to understand is this massive quantity here. And there's one change that I'd like to make, but it's a, a, a very modest one, uh, extremely minuscule, which is that I'm going to write 1 just to see that there's a general pattern here. I'm going to write 1 as 1 squared. use a trick. This trick is, is, is not completely recommended, but I will, I will say a lot more about that when we, when we get through the end. I want to understand how big this quantity is, so I'm going to use a, a geometric trick to draw a picture of this quantity. Namely, I'm going to build a pyramid, and the base of the pyramid is going to be n by n. Uh, blocks. So imagine we're in Egypt and we're building a pyramid, and the next layer is going to be n minus 1 by n minus 1. So this next layer in is n minus 1 by n minus 1. So the total number of blocks on the bottom layer is n squared. That's this, this rightmost term here. But the next term, which I didn't write in, but maybe I should, the, very, the next to the last term was this one. And that's the second layer that I've put on. Now this is the this is the, if you like the top view. But perhaps we should also think in terms of a side view. So here's the same picture. Here's we're starting at n and we build up this layer here. And now we're going to put a layer on top of it, which is a little shorter. So the first layer is of length n. And the second layer is of length n minus 1. And then on top of that, we have something like n minus 2 and so forth, and we're going to pile them up. So we pile them up all the way to the top, which is just one, one, one giant block of stone. And that's this last one, one squared. So we're going backwards in the sun. And so we have to build this whole thing up, and get all the way in the staircase pattern to this top block. All right, so here's the trick that you can use to estimate the size of this, and it's sufficient uh, in the limit as n goes to infinity. The trick is that I can imagine the solid thing underneath the staircase, like this. Uh, that's a, 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 an ordinary pyramid, not a, not a, not a staircase pyramid, which is, which is inside. And this one is inside, and so, but it's, but it's an ordinary pyramid as opposed to a, a staircase pyramid. And so we know the formula for the volume of that, because we know the formula for volumes of cones. And the formula for the volume of this guy, of the inside, um, is uh, one third base times height. And in that case, the base here, so that's one third, and the base is n by n, right? So the base is n squared. That's the base. And the height, it goes all the way to the top point. 
So both cottages and And what we discovered here is that this whole sum is bigger than one third and cubed. Now I claim that this line, by the way, has slope two, so you go half over each time you go up one. That's why you get to the top. On the other hand, I can track it on the outside too by drawing a parallel line out here. And this will go down a, a half more on this side and a half more on the other side. So the base will be n plus 1 by n plus 1 of this bigger pyramid. And it will go up one higher. All right? So on the other end, we get that this is less than a third n plus 1 cubed. Again, n plus 1 squared times n plus 1. Again, this is a, a, a base times a height of this bigger pyramid. Yes, question? Uh, the question is, it seems as if I'm adding up areas and equating it to volume, but I'm actually creating volumes by making these honest increments here. That is, the, the, the base is n, but the height is 1. Okay? The, 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 uh, thank you for pointing that out. Each one of these little staircases here has exactly height 1. So I'm, I'm honestly sticking blocks there, they're sort of square blocks, and I'm lining them up, and I'm getting, thinking of n by n cubes, if you want, honest cubes there. And they're, the height is 1, and the base is n squared. Okay? All right, so I claim that I've trapped this guy in between two quantities. And now I'm ready to take the limit. If you look at what our goal is, we want to have an expression like this, and I'm going to, uh, this was the massive expression that we had, and actually, I'm going to write it differently, I'll write it as b cubed times 1 squared plus 2 squared plus, plus n squared divided by n cubed. I'm going to combine all the n's together, alright? So the right thing to do is to divide what I had up there. Divide by n cubed in this, in this uh, uh, set of inequalities there. And what I get here is a third is less than 1 plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus n squared divided by n cubed is less than 1 third times n plus 1 cubed divided by n cubed. And that's a third times 1 plus 1 over n cubed. And now, I claim we're done, because this is a third, and the limit, as n goes to infinity, of this quantity here is easily seen to be, this is, as n goes to infinity, this goes to zero. So this also goes to a third. And so our total, total here, so our total area, under x squared, all right, which we sometimes might write the integral from 0 to b, x squared dx, is going to be equal to, well, it's this one third that I've got, but then there was also b cubed here. So there's this extra b cubed here. So it's a third b cubed. That's the, that's the result in this whole computation. Yes, question. Uh, so a, a very good question. The question is why will we leave the B over N cubed out for this step? 
And uh, part of the answer is malice of forethought. In other words, we know what we're heading for. Um, we know, we understand this quantity. It's uh, all one thing. This thing is a sum which is growing larger and larger. It's not what's called a closed form. So the thing that's not known, or not well understood, is how big is this quantity here? One squared plus two squared, the sum of the squares. Whereas this is something that's quite easy to understand. So we factor it out, and we analyze carefully the, the, the piece we show. We don't know yet how big it is. We discover that it's very, very similar to n cubed, but it's more similar to one third n cubed. It's almost identical to one third n cubed. That, this extra piece here. So that's what's going on. And then we match that. Since this thing is very similar to one third n cubed, we cancel the n cubes and we have our result. that although this may seem odd, in fact, this is what you always do if you analyze these kinds of sums. You always factor out whatever you can, and then you still are faced with a sum like this. So you, this will happen systematically every time you face with such a sum. Okay, now, I want to say one more word about notation, which is that this notation is an extreme nuisance here. And it's really sort of too large for us to deal with. And so uh, mathematicians have a, a, a shorthand for it. Unfortunately, when you actually do a computation, you're going to end up with, with this collection of stuff anyway. But I want to just show you the summation notation in order to compress it a little bit. The idea of summation notation is the following. So this, this thing tends, uh, it, it, the, the idea is the following. I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate it with an example first. So, uh, well, the general notation is the sum of ai, i equals 1 to n, is a1 plus a2 plus dot 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 plus a. So this is the, this is the abbreviation. And this is a capital C. And so this quantity here, for instance, is 1 over n cubed times the sum i squared i equals 1 to n. Right, so that's, that's what this thing is equal to. And what we just show is that that tends to 1 third as n goes to infinity. All right, so this is the this is uh, the way summation notation is is, uh, is used. There's a formula for each of these coefficients, each of these entries here, or sum ends, and then this is just an abbreviation for what the sum is. And this is the reason why I stuck in that one square at the beginning, so that you can see that the pattern worked all the way down to i equals one. It isn't an exception to the, to the rule. It's the same as all of the others. Now over here, in this board, we also had one of these extremely long sums. And this one can be written in the following way. And I hope you agree, this is rather hard to scan. But the, the uh, one way of writing it is, it's the sum from i equals 1 to n of, now I have to write down the formula for the general term, which is b over n times i b over n square. So that's uh, a, a way of abbreviating this massive formula into one which is just a lot short. And now the manipulation that I performed with it, which is to factor out this b over n cubed, is something that I'm perfectly well allowed to do also over here. This is the distributive law. This, if I factor out b cubed over n cubed, I'm left with the sum i equals 1 to n of i squared. All right? So these notations make it a little bit more compact, the, uh, what we're dealing with. 
the, the, the conceptual phenomenon is still the same, and the mess is really still just hiding under the rug. But the notation is at least fits on, on, on a, a, few, with a, a few fewer symbols. All right, so uh, let's, uh, let's continue here. I've given you one calculation, and now I want to fit it into a pattern. And here's the, here's the, the thing that I'd like to calculate. So first of all, let's try the case. So I'm going to do two more examples. I'll do two more examples, but they're going to be much, much easier, and then things are going to get much easier from now on. So the second example is going to be the function f of x is equal to x. If I draw that, that's this function here, that's the line with slope 1, and here's b. And so this area here, is the same as the area of the triangle with, with base B and height B. So the area is equal to one half B times B. So this is the base and this is the height. We also know how to find the area of triangles. And so the formula is a half B squared. And the third example, Notice, by the way, I didn't have to uh, do this elaborate summing to do that because we happen to know this area. The third example is going to be even easier. If x is equal to 1, by far the most important example. Um, remarkably, when you get to 1802 with multivariable calculus, you will forget this calculation somehow. And I don't know why, but this happens to everybody. So, so the function is just horizontal like this. Right? It's the constant one. And if we stop it at B, then the area we're interested in is just this from 0 to B. And we know that this is height 1, so this is the area of this um, base, which is B times 1. So it's B. Let's look now at the pattern. We're going to look at the pattern of the function, and it's the area under the curve, which is this, this has this elaborate formula. In terms of, so this is just the area under the curve. Yes, but this should be e to the 4 divided by 4. Right? 
right? That's, that's a reasonable guess, I would say. Right? Now, the strange thing is that in history, uh, Archimedes uh, figured out the area under a parabola. So that was a long time ago. It was after the pyramids, and he used actually a much more complicated method than I just described here. And his method, which is just fantastically amazing, was so brilliant that it may have set back mathematics by 2,000 years. Because people were so, it was so difficult that people couldn't see this pattern and couldn't see that actually these kinds of calculations are easy, so they couldn't get to the cubic. And even when they got to the cubic, they were struggling with everything else. And it wasn't until calculus put everything together that people were able to make serious progress on calculating these areas. You know, he was the expert on calculating areas and volumes for his time. So this is really a great thing that we now can have easy methods of doing it. And the main thing that I want to tell you is that we will not have to labor to build pyramids to calculate all of these quantities. We will have a way faster way of doing it. This is the slow, laborious way. And we will be able to do it so easily that it will happen as fast as you differentiate. So that's coming up tomorrow. But I want you to know that it's going to be. However, we're going to go through just a little pain before we do it. Now, I'll just tell you one more, one more piece of notation. All right. So you need to have a little practice just to recognize how how much savings we're going to make. But never again will you have to face elaborate geometric arguments like this. So let me just add a little bit of notation uh, for, the, uh, for, for, uh, uh, for definite integrals. Right? And this goes under the name of Riemann sums. Named after a, a, a mathematician from the 1800s. So this is the general procedure. Procedure for definite integrals. We divide it up into pieces. And how do we how do we do that? Well, so here's our A and here's our here's our B. And what we're going to do is break it up into little pieces. And we're going to give a name to the increment. And we're going to call that delta x. So we divide up into these. So how many pieces are there? If there are n pieces, then the general formula is always that delta x is 1 over n times the total length. So it has to be b minus a over n. We will always use these equal increments, although you don't absolutely have to do it. We will for these two minus signs. And now, there's only one bit of flexibility in, that we will allow ourselves, which is this. We're going to pick any height of f between uh, in, in the integral, in each integral. So what that means is, let me just uh, show it to you on the, on the picture here. is I just pick any value in between, I'll call it CI, which is in there, and then I go up here, and I have the level, which is F of CI, and that's the rectangle that I choose. In, other, in, the, in the case that we did, we always chose the right hand, the largest, which turned out to be the largest one, but I could have stuck, chosen some level in between, or even the left hand end, which would have 
movement of the staircase would have been quite a bit lower. All right, so any of these staircases will work perfectly well. So that means we're picking um, f of ci, and that's a height. And now we're just going to add them all up. And this is the sum of the areas of the rectangles because this is the height and this is the base. This notation is supposed to be now very suggestive of the notation that, uh, that uh, Leibniz used, which is that in the limit, this becomes an integral from a to b of f of x dx. And notice that the delta x gets replaced by a dx. So this is what happens in the limit as the, uh, the rectangles get thin. So that's as delta x goes to 0. And these, these gadgets are called Riemann sums. This is called a Riemann sum. And we've already worked out an example. This very complicated guy was an example of a Riemann sum. And so that's a notation. And uh, we'll give you a chance to get used to it a little more when we do some numerical work. All right, now the last thing for today is I promised you an example uh, which was not an area example. I want to be able to show you that integrals are, can be interpreted as cumulative sums. Integrals as cumulative sums. <clears throat> well, this is just an example, and and uh, so so here's the here's the way it goes. So we're going to consider a function f. We're going to, we're going to consider a variable t, which is time in years. And we'll consider a function f of t, which is in dollars per year. All right, this is a financial example here. That's the unit in dollars per year. And this is going to be a borrowing rate. And the reason why I want to put units in here is to show you that uh, there's a good reason for this strange dx, which we append on these, these integrals, this notation. It allows us to change variables. It allows us to be consistent with units. It allows us to develop meaningful formulas, which are, which are consistent across the board. And so I want to emphasize the units in this, in this, uh, when, I, when I set up this model and problem. Now, you're borrowing money, let's say, every day, all right? So that means delta t is 1 over 365. That's almost 1 over infinity from the point of view of various purposes, all right? So this is how much you're borrowing uh, in, in each, each time you can borrow. And let's say that you borrow your rate varies over the year. I mean, sometimes you need more money, sometimes you need less. Certainly, any business would be that way. And so here you are, you've got your money, and you're borrowing it because the rate is varied. And so how much did you borrow? Well, uh, in day um, 45, which corresponds to C over 40, that is 45 over 365, you borrowed the following amount. Here was your borrowing rate times this quantity. So dollars per year, and so this is, if you like, I want to emphasize the scaling that comes out here. You 
have you have dollars per year, and this is um, this is uh, uh, this number of years. So that comes out to be in dollars. This final amount. This is the amount that you actually borrow. So you borrow this amount. And now, if I want to add up how much you get, uh, you borrow in the entire year. That's the sum i equals 1 to 365 of f of, well, it's i over 365 times this delta t. I'll just leave this delta t. This is total amount borrowed. This is kind of a messy sum. In fact, your bank probably will keep track of it and they know how to do that. But when we're modeling things with strategies, you know, trading strategies, of course, you're really some kind of financial engineer and you want to cleverly optimize how much you borrow and how much you spend, how much you invest. This is going to be very, very similar to the integral from 0 to 1 of f of t. Of t. At, at the scale of uh, 1 over 35, uh, it's, it's probably, uh, but at 365, it's probably enough for many purposes. Now, however, there's, there's another thing for the one model which is equally important. This is how much you borrow, but there's also how much you owe the bank at the end of the year. And the amount that you owe the bank at the end of the year, I'm going to do it in a fancy way. It's you, um, the interest, we'll say, is compounded continuously. So the interest rate, if you start out with P as your principal, then after time T, you owe, so borrow P. After time T, you owe P times E to the RT, where R is your interest rate say 0.05 per year. Okay? That would be an example of an interest rate. And so, if you want to understand how much money you actually owe at the end of the year, at the end of the year what you owe is, well, you borrow these amounts here. But now you owe more at the end of the year. You owe e to the power r times the amount of time left in the year. The amount of time left in the year is 1 minus i over 365, or 365 minus i days left. So this is 1 minus i over 365. And this is what you have to add up. see how much you owe. And that is essentially the integral from 0 to 1. The delta t comes out, and you have your e to the r times 1 minus t. So the t is replacing this i over 365 f of t dt. And so when you, when you start computing and thinking about what's the right strategy, you, you're faced with integrals of this type. All right? So that's just an example, and see you next time. Remember to think about questions that you'll ask next time. Well, today you have enjoyed um, very interesting interpretations and actually very good introductions to integrations of definite integral. And um, let me stop here and get you back to the Again, the course is longer. Today is day number 22 into week number 11. And if you look back to day number 21, we get you uh, the introductions of antiderivatives on Monday. We skip differential equations for the one time of continuous picture on the definite integrals today. So during the Easter holiday, I very much wish you go back and click on this link, study what is meant by differential equations because for our purposes here is more 
They bought it, and we've gone through some very good sections today, up to Leap and Summit. All right? So if you want to know something more, make sure by tomorrow click after class, and by the end of the week click end of the week. So if you click during class today, you can review what we have done today together with the notes. Okay? Make sure you study the notes. All right? The notes help us to put things into perspective. Particularly speaking, when you see Professor David Jerison have skipped several steps. And remember, the notes are here, it's called the accompanying notes. With respect to each small section, he has prepared very good notes for us. Not long, just enough. So don't miss those notes, alright? So, happy Easter! We have a sub class today, alright? Many of you have already gone home. But I need to take attendance, all right? Section 1, Calculus 1, on day number 22, immediately before the Easter holiday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.